All right, the title of my sermon this morning is Christmas Traditions. Christmas Traditions. And I know I've preached uh, many times on Christmas. You know, it would be the fifth time now I've preached on Christmas since starting this church. So some of these things may be familiar to some of you in this room, but not to others. But hey, repetition is the key to learning because some of these traditions we got to stamp out. Some of these traditions are fine to continue. So it's always good to be reminded of the truth about Christmas. Now, I read those passages in that order because that is the order in which the Christmas story actually plays out. Now, when you think of Christmas and you think of nativity scenes, you may think of something like this, where all the characters of the story are gathered around in the stable. You've got the star in the background and Mary holding Jesus. And you may think, oh, that's a nice nativity scene and this is what Christmas is about. And that's fine to think that this is what Christmas is about. But did you know that this nativity scene, this picture, is actually incorrect? You know, so we read through that story. I don't know if you caught how the story plays out. But if you think, hey, this is the nativity scene, this is not true. This is not how it looks in the story. Or you might think it's something like this. You know, we often see nativity scenes where the shepherds and the wise men are there. Sometimes the wise men are represented as kings, but they are not kings. We're not told how many wise men there are, but why are they always represented as three? Well, they're always represented as three because of the gold and the frankincense and myrrh, but it's just ingrained in people's mind because of the song, We Three Kings of Orient Are, but they're not, they're not kings. They're wise men, and we don't know how many there were. There could have been more of them. There could have been less of them. Um, so some people, some Christians have caught on to this and, you know, obviously, I, I, I don't know where this is mainly coming from. I don't know if it's mainly coming from the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church, constantly creating these, you know, nativity scenes that are incorrect and just drilling into people this image of the nativity scene. But it is incorrect. And we'll look at that in a second. Even here, you'll see here, you know, we see the wise men. I'm not sure. I don't know if this is the shepherd because he's got his stick, or maybe this, because I'm thinking the three ones representing their gifts are here. I don't know if this is the shepherd. And the question is, like, where's Joseph? You know, jo Joseph was there too. So maybe, like, this is Catholic because of the halos. They're just taking Joseph out of the picture. Just Mary. You got the shepherd. And then you've got angels up here. You know, oh, that's all nice. Now all the characters are coming together under this stable. But this is not actually what we see in the Bible. Um, they've just all crammed all the things into one picture. But we. We don't see this. Let's, let's go to some of these passages quickly. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I want to get to some of the traditions, how people celebrate Christmas. Matthew 2, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. So what was this? This is the wise men now coming, following the star, going to Jesus. And look at this. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshipped him. So they didn't come and see the babe lying in a manger. This is a bit of a time later where they have come, they've talked to Herod, now they're going to Bethlehem looking for Jesus. Jesus no longer is in the stable anymore. Because remember, the reason why they were in the stable is because there was no room for them in the inn because she was great with child just coming to Bethlehem. So that was the first place they could find and she had to give birth. But after she's given birth and other things have taken place, they didn't stay in the stable, right? They went and probably got a place in the inn or got a house somewhere. And this is when the wise men come and they actually present the gifts to Jesus as an older child, you know, probably under two years old, because this is how Herod was trying to kill all the children that were two years old. But if you imagine a child that is, you know, Moses' age or Noah's age, you know, that's the age that Jesus would have been when the wise men came to see him. So you can see that this is incorrect, right? The wise men should not be here, right? They should not be here. Only the shepherds came. So the shepherds were there in the nativity scene. Luke 2. So this is uh, when, the when the angel comes to the shepherd and it came to pass and the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said, let, said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass. So the shepherds being in that nativity scene at the stable is doctrinally correct. But the wise men being at the stable, no. You would actually need two scenes 
to represent the story. One where the shepherds are in the stable and one where the wise men come and bow down to Jesus, present him gifts in the house that Joseph and Mary are staying. Now, what's another error in this picture? Right, if we just read through that. What's another error are the angels that are here. Now, the angels are not at the stable when the shepherds got there. If you see this passage in Luke, earth, peace, goodwill toward men, and it came to pass... So you remember the angels came to see the shepherds and said, hey, you'll find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Then they went away, right? As the angels were gone away from who? The shepherds into heaven. Then the shepherds went to see Jesus. So the picture like this is incorrect, that the angels are also there, present with everyone, and everyone's adoring Jesus. I know... You know, obviously, like, I understand why there's, you know, there's, there's a beautiful image here, but it is incorrect, and it is drilling in that incorrect image, and people are getting mixed, because they, they, they picture the story, and then they read the Bible, and they can't figure out, you know, how, how everything is happening, because this is not how it happened. And also, I don't believe, this is a personal belief of mine, but I don't believe angels look like this. I, angels, I don't believe angels have wings. Why don't I believe angels have wings? Because in Hebrews 13, the Bible says here, be not forgetful to entertain strangers. So these are people, you know, people that are visiting through. For thereby some, look at this, have entertained angels unawares. So sometimes people have been hospitable to a servant of God, a man of God that's been serving. They've had taken them in, given them a place to stay, given them something to eat, and they didn't even realize that they were entertaining angels an angel of God rather than just a servant of God who was a man. Now, if somebody came to your house and they just had these huge wings and they looked like this and they were golden and shining, I mean, you'd know that that was an angel. So that's why angels, I believe, you know, look just like men. You never see women as angels. Men are always angels in the Bible and they look just like people. They look just like men. And that's why people can entertain them. They can eat, sit and eat. And, and people don't know the difference. So that's why I don't believe angels have wings. Why do people have the idea that angels have wings? Well, it's because there are creatures in the Bible called cherubim and seraphim. So cherubim have two wings, seraphim have six wings, and these are heavenly creatures in God's throne. Satan was a cherubim. So some people think Satan is an angel. I don't believe he was. I believe he was a cherubim, and he was one of the cherubim that probably covered the mercy seat. He was right next to God, a light bearer. Uh, close to God maybe and he sinned he sinned against God and he's a fallen cherubim but yet he has convinced many angels to follow him and these are the demons and devils that are running around but I don't think they have wings but Satan does have wings so Satan would look like this but he's transformed himself into an angel of light so maybe he can hide his wings so cherubim have two wings seraphim when we read in Revelation, have six wings, right? So they're flying with two. I think two, they cover their face and two, they cover their feet. And they're the ones just saying, glory, glory, glory. Holy, holy, holy um, in Revelation. Um, now, what's another thing? that all, this, is, and this, is, this is a small point, right? I just think this is interesting. This, this always bugs me about nativity scenes too. Now, it's very clear when the angels come to the shepherds, that the angels say, you'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And this is important because this is a sign that he's telling them. This is how you know the Messiah in this stable because you'll find this babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. But yet when you get these nativity scenes, sometimes with the angels and the wise men that shouldn't be there, Mary is holding the baby. So I just think it'd be better if the nativity scene was accurate and they came and they found the baby, as it says in the scriptures, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in the manger. So this one, like she's holding the baby. This one, she's holding the baby. Now this one, he's actually in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger. But then I don't know whether that's Joseph or the shepherd. But how often do you see nativity scenes like this? Right, where Jesus is not wrapped in swaddling clothes. See, so Jesus, baby Jesus should be wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, because that's part of the scriptural story that we are given. And what about this? I don't even know what this is. I was looking up 
baby Jesus is on, on Google. And I'm like, what is this? This is like some black baby. Um, and he's not wrapped at all in a manger. I don't know, this is like maybe the black Hebrew Israelites. Um, baby Jesus. So you can see how tradition is a powerful thing, isn't it? Tradition is a powerful thing. What is passed down? Because what's passed down ingrains in people's mind what the nativity scene is, even though it's not biblically true. Right? So we have to be careful with traditions. But traditions, even though traditions are a powerful thing, right? So they can reinforce things that are right and they can reinforce things that are wrong. So you don't just get this idea that all traditions are bad, right? Because maybe you come from a culture where there are all these bad traditions and you just think, oh, I don't want to do any tradition. Well, newsflash, guys, church is a tradition. You know, why do we worship on Sundays? It's a tradition. You know, what, these are just, like, why are we saying these are things that are passed down? There's nothing wrong inherently with traditions. It's just that there are good traditions and there are bad traditions. Why? Because traditions are made to reinforce truth, but they can also reinforce lies. And that's the problem. Second Thessalonians 2, look at this. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. So the problem is, is when some denominations or some churches try and push unbiblical or wrong traditions, traditions that go against the Bible. Like, for example, infant baptism is a tradition that is passed down that goes against scriptural practice and yet it is passed down and yet you know, they will use a verse like this to say hey well you should hold the traditions which were taught by us but these are tra the wrong traditions that are going against the word of god these are things that were not taught by word or epistle by the apostles so what is a tradition like i said a tradition is just a custom or a belief that is passed down from previous generations and they can be good or bad. Here's another verse that shows, hey, tradition can be a good thing. It's a practice that is passed down. The apostles passed down the practices and the traditions that we keep today through word and through the scriptures. Second Thessalonians 3, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. <coughs> Now, when are traditions bad? Let's look at verses where traditions are not good. 1 Peter 1.18 For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. So one tradition, a type of tradition that is bad is when it's vain. What does that mean? There's no profit. There's no point to do it. Right? So you do this tradition just because it's passed down and it takes up your time, it takes up your resources, it makes people do obligatory things and yet it has nothing to do with God, it has no profit at all in it. People have things like that, maybe like sporting traditions or things, you know, things that your family just does but it's just about having fun, it's not about God. You know, things should always be, whether you eat or whether you drink, do all to the glory of God. The traditions that we have as believers should always point people to Jesus Christ. Should point our family, everything we do should have a spiritual application or something that helps us in our spiritual walk. Colossians 2, here's another one. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. So what is another bad tradition? One that is deceptive. One that actually teaches you the wrong thing. Right? And there are many traditions out there that teach you the wrong thing. Um, and we're talking about Christmas, right? Like with Santa Claus and whatnot. Mark 7. Here's another example. Well, here's where we actually see... Uh, well, here's an example where Jesus is actually rebuking the Pharisees for the traditions they hold. Then came together unto him the Pharisees <clears throat> and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. So what's happening? He's saying that the, the disciples of Jesus, they're eating, but they didn't wash their hands, right? So they're eating with dirty, dirty hands. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. So you see here that there's a tradition that is being held, 
of washing the hands before you eat. Now you might be thinking right now, well, don't, well, you, shouldn't you wash your hands before you eat? Well, let's, let's continue, right? Because it's not just the fact, we're not, Jesus is not rebuking the fact that they're washing their hands. We'll see what he's actually rebuking. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be, which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and of tables. So they have a lot of washing that they do that as part of the things that they teach people to do. Then the Pharisees and scribes ask him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you, hypocrites, as it is written, The people honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And that's often the problem. That's often the difference between a bad tradition and a good tradition. This one tradition is vain when it has nothing to do with Jesus, because you honour something with your lips, right? Even you honour God with your lips. But what's the problem? Your heart is far from Your heart is not actually on the Lord Jesus Christ. Here again, how be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now what is the problem with this tradition that they're doing, this washing of the hands and pots and things like that? For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honour thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father and mother, let him die the death. So now he goes on. So they, they talked about the washing. Now he goes on. Here's another tradition that you have. That is what? Rejecting full well, rejecting the commandment of God or making the word of God of none effect. For Moses said, Honour thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. So these are laws in the Old Testament where God was very serious about because this is the seriousness of the respect we're meant to show our parents. Not only that, to provide for them, right, when they need it. But, verse 11, here's their tradition. Ye say... If a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. So what is he saying here? When you give to something to your parents and you say, hey, look, this is a gift that you're profiting by me. And God is saying, no, 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 you have an obligation to look after your parents. It's not a gift. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect, through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such things do ye. And when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Now, why did this confuse the people? Now, we have the scriptures, right? So we can read on. And know what Jesus is talking about when he says the things that come out of that man, they, that defile him. But think about the people that are there thinking about only physical things. Because what is the problem? Is the problem, like how does washing your hands and your plates and your cups before you eat make the commandment of God of none effect? Because we do that. Are we making the commandment of God of none effect? No, because the problem here is they were thinking that makes them spiritually clean. So they're doing these physical things. They're not just doing it to be hygienic. They literally think, well, if I have to wash my hands and wash my cup, because I'm going to be defiled spiritually if I eat something that is unwashed. So you see how they're trying, to, they're trying to be made perfect by the flesh, something that is physical, making them perfect spiritually. right? And this is why he's saying you're making the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. right? By having these traditions and realizing this is not what makes you clean. And this is why he says, hey, it's not what goes into you that defiles the man. It's what comes out of you. But then they're probably thinking, what? Because you eat? Is it, is it when you go to the toilet? That's what defiles you? It's like, who's consuming that? And that's when he explains to them. Because they ask him, explain to us the parable. And then he says, don't you understand? Because when you eat something, it goes out in the draft, right? It purging all meats. But when he talks about what comes out of him, he's saying, hey, what comes out of the heart? Evil, adulteries, murders, that defileth the man, right? Because it comes from within. 
So you understand now why it's not, it's not a problem with just washing your hands in general, just washing, being hygienic. It's thinking that your hygiene is somehow making you spiritual clean, spiritually clean when it's not, as well as consuming things and thinking they make you spiritually unclean. Because remember the Jews, they thought, hey, this is, because they were taught clean and unclean laws. They were taught you shouldn't consume this. I was like Peter. He says, hey, God, like never on this animal and entered my mouth, right? But it was a picture of a spiritual truth, right? But they had just taken that physical law to the nth degree and thought that it made them spiritually clean. So that's what's going on in Mark 7. So Jesus is not just rebuking all traditions in this story, right? It's just those that make God's word of none effect. Now, obviously, this applies to Christmas because in Christmas, people have traditions. And one tradition we ought to stay away from as Christians is this tradition of Santa Claus and elves. Because Santa Claus and the elves breaks all these rules, if you think about it, because it's vain. Because what, is it, what does Santa Claus and the elves have to do with Jesus Christ? And yet Christians still today buying Santa merchandise, buying Santa cup, buying elf costumes and things like that. Why fuel this vain tradition that has nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ? If you want to make Christmas about the Lord Jesus Christ, if you want to celebrate this day and remember the Lord Jesus Christ, then make it about that. But don't buy into this vain tradition of the world that is trying to change Christmas about the birth of Jesus Christ, about the coming of our Lord into this guy flying around with reindeer, living in the North Pole, working with elves and delivering you know, Christmas presents to materialistic children. So one, it breaks out, it's vain. Two, it's deceptive because parents will lie to their children. I mean, why, why would you lie to your children and dress up as Santa Claus, make them think he's calm, eat the cookies and the milk, leave the presents, just to deceive them? And this is, this is not how we should raise our kids. Don't deceive them about things. Tell them the truth. Don't deceive them about Christmas, about the Easter Bunny, about the Tooth Fairy, and about any other you know, cultural tradition that you have that's just tricking your children into believing something. You know, they're, they're the sort of children that you're going to raise that when you grow up and you tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what they're going to think? They're just going to think that's another myth that you're telling them. Right? So make sure you make them understand, hey, there is truth and there are lies. There is one truth. And you will be honest with them and tell them what is true and what is not. How does Christmas make the commandment of God of none effect? I've already sort of mentioned it. But it's the materialism. You know how many times they teach children, hey, chill, kids, let's sit down, let's write our wish list out to Santa. Oh, I want this and I want that. This is what I want. Give me, oh, give me, give me, give me. To me, that's like a tradition that's just making the commandment of God of none effect. Because we're not meant to be covetous. And yet we have a tradition that teaches children just to think about them, what they're getting, you know, what, what they want. Now, can Christmas be done in a good way? Of course, that's why I'm not, I'm not saying all tradition is bad. And that's why with Christmas, there are extremes. And you probably are aware, you know, there are people on both sides of the spectrum that say Christians should not celebrate Christmas because it's pagan and it's material, you know, and all that stuff. And then there's the other side of the coin where you just have Christians just slurping it all in and just like doing everything Christmas and do, doing the, you know, and it's just, it's just sometimes just vain because they don't even care. They're so busy celebrating Christmas that they don't even come to church on Christmas Day. That's one way you can make the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition is you go spending all this time celebrating Christmas and then you don't come to the house of God to worship the house, to, to worship God on the day you're meant to remember the birth of Jesus Christ. How many times does that, does that happen right, in churches where Christmas and Easter are often those periods of time, those holidays that are meant to be about Jesus is when church attendance is at its lowest. Why? Because people are so busy keeping traditions. So traditions are not necessarily bad, but the bad ones are vain, deceptive. They make the word of God of none effect. And Christians ought not participate or fund this Santa Claus and elves industry. I feel very strongly against it because I just, I, just, I just don't understand why Christians who ought to have a passion for the truth, that know and believe the truth, will willfully participate in deception. 
Now let's get into some. I just got three things about Christmas, three traditions that we'll talk about and sort of go to sides because what I'm kind of addressing here is more so people that say you shouldn't celebrate Christmas, right? Because obviously there are traditions. There's nothing wrong with traditions in and of themselves. You know, traditions are there. Everything is a tradition if you come down. All our practices are passed down and we have to just, you know, we can keep the good ones, don't keep the bad ones. But there are people out there that say, no, nobody should celebrate Christmas because it's pagan. And we'll go over the traditions where people try and accuse Christmas of being pagan and say, well, this is why you shouldn't celebrate. The first one is the date. The date itself is a tradition, right? And why is it a tradition? Because we're not told in the Bible that Jesus was born on the 25th of December. We're not told the date. We don't know the date Jesus was born. You know, oftentimes Muslims will ask us, you know, they think like, was, was Jesus really born? On... Because to them, because, you know, everyone just keeps believing like these things. It's like sometimes Muslims think like, like why, why doesn't every Christian celebrate Christmas? Isn't it in the Bible? You know, or, you know, they'll say like, you know, how, why was Jesus actually born on the 25th? Is that in the Bible? But we just have to understand that these are traditions where people just, you know, use that day to remember the birth of Jesus. But we don't know. What day? And in fact, the 25th of December is probably the wrong time of the year that Jesus was born. Why? And this is what a lot of people believe. In Luke 2, it says, And they were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, we live in the southern hemisphere, right? So here in December, it's summer, it's hot. So you could do that. But in the northern hemisphere, where these guys are, it's cold. So a lot of people think, well, at that time of the year, shepherds would not be staying out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. They would be bringing their sheep in or their cattle in because it's too cold outside. So they think actually it's probably around June, around that time when Jesus was born. But when was he born? We don't know. Does it matter when he was born? No, because it doesn't change anything significant. Um, you know, do you, do, can you only celebrate Christmas if you know the exact day? No. Because you can have a day to remember a significant event, even if you don't know the day that it is. Now, why is Christmas celebrated on the 25th of December? And this is why people say, oh, you shouldn't celebrate Christmas as pagan. Because the 25th of December, supposedly, was a day when the Roman Empire would worship the sun god. Right? So the 25th, and then when Emperor Constantine took over the Roman Empire and Christianity became the state religion, they then changed that date to be a Christian holiday instead of a pagan holiday. So people will say, well, because the 25th of December has pagan roots, we should have nothing to do with the 25th of December. It's all pagan. You're just, you know, if you're, celebrating, if you're remembering the birth of Jesus Christ, you're just participating in a pagan holiday and you ought to have nothing to do with it. Now, let me ask you this. Because that's the mindset of people that think Christmas should not be celebrated, right? Maybe people who celebrate Christmas haven't really thought. Maybe there are people celebrating Christmas in ignorance thinking that's when Jesus actually was born. Or they just think that that's just the day that Christmas always was on and they don't realize where that date actually came from and why that date is significant in the calendar and became the date that people remember the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the history. But let me ask you, like, do pagans own the dates on which they celebrate their pagan holidays it's like if a pagan celebrates a holiday on a certain day like now that date is off limits nobody's allowed to use that date anymore like if somebody does something pagan on a specific date that means no christian ever now is allowed to celebrate anything on that day because if they do it had pagan ori origins right so you see the the flawed logic in this is if it's pagan if one day of the year is pagan, I mean, how many days of the year are there? There's only 366 days. I mean, surely there's probably some pagan remembrance or some pagan holiday on every day of the year. Are you allowed to celebrate anything? You know, are you allowed to remember anything on any day? Because if you do anything, it's pagan now. It has some pa Somebody's going to find some event somewhere in history by some pagan society that did something on that day. It's like, ah, you are just following that pagan holiday by remembering the birth of Jesus Christ on that date so that's why some people i don't know that's the whole reason why because i mean there's all these sorts of traditions 
But is that why you can't celebrate Christmas? You can't celebrate Easter, New Year's, birthdays, anniversaries? Just using a date is pagan now? Now why? It's funny when you look into like these, the people that try and link all these things together, right? Link up pagan things or link up like these conspiracy theories. Now, are there conspiracy theories out there? Yes. So I'm not just writing them all off. But anybody who's ever looked into conspiracy theories, you know it is a jungle out there. Like there is all sorts of like crazy things out there. And, and sometimes you'll watch like that YouTube video that's saying like, oh, like look at this, and then we draw this line here and then make the thing. And you're just like, oh man, it's like everything's drawn by the Illuminati. Like, oh man. And you just, you, you got to understand this. Why is it so easy for these conspiracy theorists to link like these, these totally unrelated facts? You just think like, man, it just seems to align so well, like everything. And the, the, you know why it is? Because there are only so many numbers. Like if you think about it, every number is made out of 10 different digits, right? Zero to nine. And there are only so many shapes. It's triangle, circle, square, I mean, unless you start getting into the polygons, right? Let's not go there. The polygons, you've got an infinite amount of polygons, right? But basic shapes, you, there's only so many that you can count on your fingers. So no wonder when you're looking at symbolism and you're looking at things that aren't just text explaining it to you, you can draw all these conclusions and join them all together, right? Because you're going to find that number there. You're going to find this number or you double it, you halve it, and then you triple it, and then you do this. You know, somebody, I, I got an example, right? Let's do it with the wise men. You say, oh, these people, they want to want to push Christmas. Always, always the three, what, three kings, isn't it? Three. You know three, if you do 33? Ah, that's Freemasonry. That's, that's the Illuminati. What's three times two? It's six, and you get three sixes. Ah, 666. Six, six. Ah, satanic, right? And then they say, you know, a triangle has three points. You know, the top, the, 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 the all-seeing eye, the triangle of the Illuminati. That's why they are pushing Christmas, because it's just this Illuminati, secret, pagan holiday that they want all Christian. And you know, Victor, you know why he's pushing it? Because he's 33 years old. Yeah. Right? Ah, you know, see, that's why he's pushing Christmas so much. But you see how easy it is to do. And, they, and, and when you realize that, those videos on YouTube don't seem so convincing anymore because it's just like, how did you link this and that? Oh, because they typed some number into a numerology chart and got this number and then linked it to this. And it's just like, you know, they saw a clock in the video and it was like 33 past. Ah, oh, see? Now, are there conspiracy theories out there? There are. I'm not saying there isn't. But don't get carried away with just believing everything that's out there. Because like I said, there's only so many shapes, there's only so many numbers, and this is why they can just build these theories that are just never ending and just link all sorts of things. Because this world is filled with numbers and shapes. Right? So, pagans don't own the date. You know, like if Christians have repurposed the date to remember the birth of Jesus Christ, that's great. You know, it's no different to like repurposing a building. You know, like if Muslims built a building and then they went out of business and then we went in and repurposed it, are we like having a pagan celebration now? A pay no, it's just the building is the building. If we repurposed it for something for God, you know, it's, there's not always something wrong with that. All right, that's the date. Let's go on to the second one, the tree. The tree. This is another one where people go, ah, you know, you decorate that tree, you idol worshipper. You know, putting that idol in your house and, you know, you may as well just be a pagan. <clears throat> now, where do they get it from? Jeremiah 10. Let's go through Jeremiah 10 quickly and I'll just show you that. A lot of people think Jeremiah 10 is talking about a Christmas tree, but if you actually read through it and, and look at what it's actually saying, it's, it's not talking about a Christmas tree at all. But you can see why people will use this verse out of context to make people think decorating a tree on Christmas is idolatry. Jeremiah 10. Hear ye the word of the Lord, which hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you. O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. So this is talking about, hey, don't copy bad traditions from unbelievers. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workman with the axe. 
They deck it with silver and gold, with gold. So, you know, deck the halls with boughs of holly. So see, people see that. Ah, so you take a tree out and you deck it with gold and silver. It's Christmas. See, you, you pagan, you know, decorating a tree. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. So you just have to keep reading until you start getting hints that this is not a tree that people are decorating because people don't decorate a tree and then move it around the house, right? G generally the problem with Christmas is it stays up until next Christmas, right? Like, you know, some people's houses, they just have where their Christmas tree is and they just like cover it and then next Christmas they just open it up again. <laughs> they just never pack it. You may as well not pack it away. It's already like October. You know, Christmas is coming up. It never moves, this tree. They are upright. Verse 5. Look at this. They are upright as the palm tree. Now that's, that's a pretty poor analogy, a pretty poor simile when you're comparing something to itself. You say like, hey, this speaker is like a speaker. You know, you don't do that. You, you compare something that is different to something that is, you know, you compare something to something that is different. So this is not a tree that they're decorating because when everyone looks at a Christmas tree, they see a tree. You don't say, hey, that tree, Christmas tree looks like a tree. You say, that thing is like standing up like a tree. So what is standing up like a tree? Well, it's an idol that is standing up like a tree. They are upright as the palm tree. So what is going on here? It's not that they're decorating a tree as a tradition just to remember things about Jesus Christ. They are actually fashioning a graven or a molten image into an idol from the tree. Look at this. They are upright as the palm tree. But speak not. This, tell me, this tells me it's got a mouth. Nobody is expecting a Christmas tree to talk. But idols they make with mouths. They must needs be born. See, so this thing is being carried around. Think about the Catholics, how they have their idols and they're carrying it around. It needs to, because it can't move itself, it can't speak. So it needs people to carry it around because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O, God, o Lord, thou art great and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms there is none like unto thee. But they are all together brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish. So you see here, at Christmas, nobody is actually using real silver and gold on their Christmas tree. I mean, unless you're some billionaire just trying to make a show, right? So this is actual silver and gold. They're not just decking it with representations of silver and gold to represent something else. They are physically bringing silver and gold. Why? Because they are covering this idol with gold and silver, you know? From Uphaz, the work of the workman and of the hands of the founder. Blue and purple is their clothing. All right, so you can see now that somebody's clothing this idol. They are all the work of cunning men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath the earth shall tremble and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. Thus shall ye say unto them, the gods, little g, that have not made the heavens. So you can see now the context of Jeremiah 10 is comparing the Lord to the false gods that are being worshipped and built by the people themselves. And the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens. And he causeth the vapours to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain and bringeth forth the winds out of his treasures. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder, so he's talking about the people that worship idols, right? All these idolaters. Every founder is confounded by the grain of an image. Isn't that so crazy? The Bible talks about that a lot, where it's just like the people worship something that they created. Like they literally cut the tree out of the forest. They fashion it. They plate it with gold. They put it in this plate. They have to move it because it can't move. Itself. And then they bow down and go, Lord, save us. Lord, protect us. Lord, unbelievable, isn't it? When you think about idolatry. A uh, graven image, confounded, is confounded by the graven image, for his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. They are vanity and the work of errors. In the time of their visitation they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts 
is his name. So is this passage talking about decorating a tree? No, it is a passage that is talking about making an idol. So just be careful when you're reading out there about stuff. They often will go to that verse, right? This one. One cut of the tree out of the forest, they deck it with silver and with gold. And then they'll have a picture of a Christmas tree saying, hey, this is a pagan idol. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about just traditions that people have to remember the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing wrong with that. This is talking about building an idol and actually bowing down to it. So is a Christmas tree pagan? Like we talked about with dates, just because pagans do something, does that mean nobody else is allowed to do it? I mean, is there anything inherently pagan about trees? You know, do pagans own trees? A, a decoration, you know, a decoration's pagan. You, know, you can't decorate your house anymore because if you decorate something, you, you, you're participating in pagan practices. You, you own a garden and you have trees around and you like to make them look nice. Now you're a pagan. A light's pagan. I don't know, I've never heard that one before, but I'm sure somebody's out there saying lights are pagan. Um, a circle's pagan. I've heard that one before. Remember, you know, because the balls on the, you know, it's not that you put a ball on the Christmas tree to represent the gold that was given to Jesus. It's because those balls represent some pagan symbolism. Or the star, you know, the star is one. Like I said, there, there are these basic shapes and numbers that people just link together. That just doesn't mean the pagans own every digit and they own every shape. And therefore, Christians cannot have any of these things anywhere in anything they do. Um, is the star pagan? You know, well, that's in the Bible, right? The wise men followed the star, and it's gold pagan, and the wise men gave gold. So often people, and I, you know, I'm not big on the Christmas tree, you know, so I'm not, I'm not trying to say we have to do the Christmas tree and have to do these things. It's just people that say you shouldn't. You know, this is the whole going back to the commandments and convictions, right? People have strong convictions about celebrating holidays, and they try and condemn everybody who does it. But if you're going to do it, at least do it in truth in spirit and in truth. So people, you know, they have the Christmas tree, the gold represents certain things, tree represents new life, the star on the top of the tree, they say, hey, it's the star that the wise men followed, and what, and giving gifts and, and things like that is, is all part of the Christmas story. So people can make these things relate to the day. Uh, so they're not inherently wrong in and of themselves. Whether or not you make them a big deal or not is entirely up to you and your family. This is the area of convictions. I want to just cover this last one because I've heard this. I don't know if you guys have ever heard this before, but one of the practices in Christmas is the giving of gifts. And I heard somebody say once to me, and I'm sure it's out there because they would have read it somewhere, that giving gifts is pagan. You know, like, and receiving gifts is pagan. And I don't know if you've heard that before, but th these are the verses that they will go to to try and, use, to try and say that. Right? Exodus 23. Uh, this pagan gift-giving practice has to stop, right? And thou shalt take no gift, for the gift blindeth the wise and perverteth the words of judgment. Now, if I just read the whole verse, you'll probably already know what these gifts are talking about. But they'll just say, Exodus 20, ah, the Bible says thou shalt take no gift. Well, you could say, oh, it doesn't say don't give a gift. Right, so then how can you take gifts? I don't know how they work it out. But... Thou shalt take no gift, for the gift blindeth the wise and perverteth the words of judgment. Now what is this talking about, this gift? This is talking about bribery. Yep. Right? This is the gift that it's talking about. It's not talking about doing something nice for somebody. But you know, there's a grey line between that. I mean, most, you know, my company has the policy too of like how to receive gifts. Right? So that's why it's right to say it's a gift, because sometimes people will you know, take executives out for lunch and buy them nice things and do things like that to try and get a business deal. That happens, right? So a lot of companies often have policies to say gifts over a certain amount, you've got to declare, you have to reject, you can't do so. It has to be like a trivial gift if you're receiving too many. Why? Because it's going to start changing how you judge things, not even in a company, but even in politics as well. People can be resting judgment. So this is what this is talking about. This is talking about the leaders of a country should not be accepting bribes. They should be careful of gifts. They, thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons. Neither take a gift, for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. Now what's so crazy, and I just think people that are getting stuck into this everything is pagan, sometimes they don't even think about, you know, the rest of the Bible. Because if you say giving gifts is pagan, 
I mean, do you know who's the greatest gift giver of all? The Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty. I mean, that's why people give gifts on Christmas, because it's to remember the greatest gift that was given to us, which is the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. James 1, look at this. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. So there are good gifts and there are bad gifts, right? Every good gift comes from God and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variables, neither shadow of turning. Man, if it's a sin, if it's pagan to give gifts, I would not be accusing God of paganism. Uh, Romans 6, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And last, last one here on this gift thing, 2 Corinthians 9, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift Amen. right so pagans do they celebrate by giving gifts they do and people somebody might go to revelation 11 and say look hey during the god pouring out his wrath you know and the two witnesses are you know i don't know if you know the story you know the two witnesses a lot of people think it's moses and elijah right because moses was body was buried somewhere and we don't know where it is elijah was taken up by the whirlwind so people think the two witnesses in revelation are moses and elijah because they send plagues and they bring fire down from earth and that's what moses and elijah did right so this is like moses and elijah come back they're preaching eventually they get killed and then everyone's celebrating that they're dead right so this is what's happening in revelation 11:10. 10 it says they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them why the fact that they're dead and make merry like merry christmas and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So you see, how this is how pagans celebrate. Pagans celebrate by giving gifts. You ought not be a pagan. And so, so then, the, you know, this is why you always have to ask yourself the question, do pagans just own everything just because they do it? Just yeah. because a pagan did it before me? I can't do it? You know, it's like, so pagans, they do many things that Christians do. You know, pagans, I'm sure they gather in buildings like we are here this morning. I'm sure pagans sing songs together you know i'm sure pagans do public speaking and teach their followers right i'm sure pagans do that too and i'm sure pagans you know what i'm sure pagans give gifts and they feast together on special occasions so are we in a pagan gathering here just because we do all that so you see how like the you know, pagans don't own everything so don't get this idea that just because a pagan does something that therefore christians can't do it you need to be able to discern what is actually wrong about that what is vain about it what is deceptive about it about it is it something that is making the word of god of none effect and that's what you should get rid of and then whether you decide to carry on the tradition is another thing right because traditions can take up a lot of time you know keeping this tradition keeping that tradition so you've got to think about how you use your time you just can't keep everything that society wants you to do because if you do then that's why people have no time for god anymore so what are some closing thoughts one is should christians celebrate christmas it's not if you celebrate christmas it's how you celebrate christmas now, if you choose to celebrate christmas what's important about it is how you celebrate and if you choose not to celebrate christmas you ought not to condemn people that do choose to remember the birth of jesus christ on a particular day now do i celebrate christmas i mean to some extent i do i don't have a problem with having a christmas preaching on christmas day giving out gifts and using it as a time to remember the lord jesus christ i mean the date for example just going through the three things we talked about the date you know i think it's just by convenience i mean it's already there people already know it it's already a state public holiday why not use the day that's already there you know i don't care about the origins i mean i'm aware of it i know where it comes from but i also so know if there's nothing wrong with using that day for a christian reason because the pagans don't own that day i mean maybe you can thank them that you've got the public holiday to you know that the state actually gives you the public holiday and a lot of people are grateful for public holidays you know what about the tree i'm kind of indifferent towards the tree you know elizabeth sometimes talks about doing it wanting to do something for the kids if she does the tree if she doesn't do the tree if she does some other thing just to point the kids to jesus christ it doesn't really bother me at all you know i'm, I'm kind of indifferent towards the tree now the gifts 
I don't have a problem with people giving gifts. I like to receive gifts. You know, I like to give gifts. Um, but see, you know what I don't like about gift giving on special occasions is I don't like money being wasted on obligatory, unnecessary, or unwanted gifts. Yeah. And that often happens at these times. You probably know yourself, man, I'm going to this thing, yeah. and I gotta buy people a gift because I have to buy. That's what I don't like about gift giving. Yeah. I don't like money being wasted just to buy things, just to keep up appearances. Yeah. And when people are just think, hey, you're, you gotta celebrate, you gotta give gifts, you gotta do this at Christmas, you gotta do, when the other generations before us just keep pushing that on, I just feel it's a waste of God's money. So it's not wrong to do it, but we just have to make sure we're doing it wisely. And just, you know, if you have the disposable income to buy gifts, then by all means do it. And you want to be a blessing to somebody else. But I think also people that are, are struggling and don't have the money and then are wasting money on buying gifts that probably the people don't even want anyway. And you know, sometimes people, what boggles my mind sometimes is people that give people a hard time for not giving gifts and yet you know we're all rich here i don't need i don't need whatever you could afford under fifty dollars i roll you know chances are if something's under fifty dollars you probably already got it because you can buy it so if you think about the things that we need in a prosperous country they're all expensive stuff you know, and that's why i think all this really small gift giving can be a big waste of money so give gifts by all means i'm not condemning the giving of gifts what i'm saying is what i don't like about it it's just being duped out of your hard-earned money because of societal obligations. And one of the main reasons why they are there is because commercially, the businesses want you. You know, think about this, right? Well, I think about sometimes the holidays that are celebrated and are always in the, on the TV and always on the YouTube ads and everything. It's all the stuff that causes you to buy stuff. Why? Because they, they want you to, to spend money. Hey, Chris, you've got to buy things. Easter, you've got to buy things. Valentine's Day, oh, you've got to buy things. They want to keep them alive. And whilst it's okay to give gifts, just don't be duped into thinking you have to and just wasting a lot of your money. It's a bit like engagement rings. Yep. You know, engagement rings, there's this one thing, like, I'm just, when I, one of my pet peeves, just because yep. they're so damn expensive. Right, engagement rings and the only reason why women want them is because they've been duped into thinking they're valuable i mean if you look in uh, i'm sorry to a different topic i want gifts all right so it's related but if you look up diamond rings the history of diamond rings you know you've you got to learn about the diamond cartels right and they're just like keeping all the diamonds away to artificially inflate the prices and then they came out with this marketing campaign diamonds are forever and he only really loves you and he buys you a diamond and if you want a diamond it just shows you got duped by this cartel and this marketing campaign to make your husband spend what a third or a quarter of his annual salary which could go into a house that you need it's crazy it's crazy that people do that how much money they spend on engagement rings and you ladies you are the ones that are fueling it. This is one thing I don't like about Christmas. We are the ones who should be preventing it. Our believers, the people of God, why are we the ones fueling this? Right, man, things ought to stop at the house of God. And if it's happening here, we ought to put a stop to it. How do we ever think we're going to influence society if we are just taking it hook, line, and sinker? Romans 14, we'll end here. So this is Christmas. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. So whether you celebrate Christmas or not, one thing is for certain, I want nothing to do with the lie of Santa Claus and his elves. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. Um, I just pray, Lord, that this sermon was uh, edifying and uh, uh, people learn the truths about Christmas. Help us, Lord, to not just perpetuate 
are vain or deceptive or traditions that make your word of none effect. Help us, Lord, to be a people of truth and to be people that allow conviction in areas of liberty. So we thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day in this country where many people around the world remember the birth, the death, the burial, and resurrection of the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just thank you so much for this unspeakable gift that we have eternal life. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.